human factor, the leadership factor, when it comes to controlling the state. That's where Machiavelli's prince comes in rather nicely. And there's a number of things that the selections that I've given you here provide for. First of all, a <coughs> prince, whoever he or she happens to be, right? And a prince can be, you know, a king, a queen, a czar, emperor, prime minister, you know, whatever it is, just, you know, just prince, whatever. First thing is that the leader needs to know some kind of military tactics. Needs to be well versed in military history. He needs to know his country's capabilities, the extent of his country's resources, and also learn from history. This is also something, I, I wanted to spend just a, a small bit of time here on this last one, knowing history. Because realists get a bad rap by liberalists, constructivists, and others who say that realists just don't take history into account. They just don't simply learn from the past, right? Because things are just constantly in some vicious cycle of you know, self-interest and self-help. That's not entirely true. A good leader in a realist system can be one of the most powerful, one of the most prudent, and also one of the most light leaders of his or her time. Knowing history simply means know when to throw a punch and know when to pull it. Know when to wage war, but also know when to try to avoid it. Don't get yourself entangled into situations that are more costly for you to get out of than to get in. So here we get a number of comparisons that Machiavelli notes, how a prince should act. And we talk about the relationship between generosity and parsimony. Let's talk about that one first. What do we mean? What does the word parsimony mean? What do we understand the word parsimony to, to be here? Even if you haven't heard the word before, you might be able to kind of reverse engineer it by knowing <coughs> that it is somewhat of an antonym to being generous. Okay, sort of do, do as little as you need to do or expend as little as you need to spend in order to accomplish your goal. It doesn't necessarily mean be cheap. Being cheap means that you could still screw up a war. You could still underfund an army. But what Machiavelli is talking about here is parsimony is much better than generosity. Why? Because when you are the leader of a state, you are effectively in charge of the state's resources. It's money, it's manpower, and it's capabilities. Going to war is costly. I mean, that's just a bottom line. I don't care what Donald Rumsfeld said, okay? Nine times out of 10, when you wage war, almost always what happens? What do you need to do as a leader is domestically? If you're gonna go to war, you have to raise taxes. I mean, that's just duh. Okay? Now how much you raise is a different story, but it's almost, it's, you know, it's almost, it, you know, it's almost automatic that taxes are raised. But when you raise taxes, you risk the ire of your own people because no one likes paying taxes. Better yet, you could raise taxes as long as you have the people know. This is all good for those of you that are planning on taking over the world at one point. This is all good stuff here. Okay? going to raise taxes, you could still get the people behind you, provided that you promise to show them where the money is going. You know, you know how you, you know, you're driving on the highway and you see these signs, you know, your tax dollars at work or whatever it happens to be, and you tend to think that that means that their potholes are being fixed. Right? I tend to think that it's sort of a bluff. It just, we can just put a, you put a sign up and just set your tax dollars at work. But we would like to know that our tax dollars are going to something that benefits everybody, right? Schools, roads, hospitals, education, something like that, rather than lining the pockets of a few people. So in that regard, being parsimony means making certain that you spend your subject's money prudently. And if you're going to go to war, you better make certain that the resources are necessary to fight and win said war. This is probably one of the most normative aspects 
of realism, but this comes along pretty much every single time and is something that is, I think, critically important to talk about. Machiavelli talks about the difference between a leader that is loved versus feared. Which one does Machiavelli say is better? What's better, to be loved or to be feared? All together now? Feared. To be feared. Why? 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 Why should be fe Why is it better to be feared than to be loved? Ah, he doesn't necessarily say that, but that's ultimately where we're going. Okay, being feared means we would like to be respected. And how does that equate? What do you mean by that? What's 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 cool about being respected? What's cool about being respected here? So you're saying that loyalty remains fixed. Okay, what else comes out of being respected? You won't be challenged. Right? If you're feared and respected, for the most part, nobody's going to question your authority. And why? Why is that? Because any, any person that potentially wants to take your spot knows that you have a bunch of uh, people to back you up. Ah, very good. There might be one or two people in the room that want to supplant you, but they know that everyone else is going to back up that person. Fair enough. So in this case, when we talk about being feared, <coughs> feared and being respected, how can one go about doing that domestically? How can one do that? How can one be feared and respected domestically? This is all important for maintaining a united front on the international front. Punish those who show Punish those that show disloyalty. I could go a little bit better than that, but you're on the right track. Display those that have been punished for disloyalty? Display those that have been punished. Mm -hmm. Well, now you run the risk of being hated. We'll get to that in a moment. Well, better yet, how about this one? How should one interpret the law? How should one interpret the law? Uh, it's fair for everyone. Be objective. Be objective for everyone. If the law says this, then everyone must be subjected to that law. No PBA card, no dropping names, you speed, you get a ticket. Nobody likes it, but that's just what it is. Okay? And I'm sure that you know, just going back to the speeding ticket analogy, I'm sure that you all know of one town in the area where you live or at least one street or one area of a town where you live that you just don't speed because you know that the cops are always going to be there. Right? We lovingly refer to a place close by here as Highland Park. <laughs> okay? They're notorious. Highland Park is notorious for pulling people over. So the point is, is that nobody speeds there. Does everybody like it? Of course not. But are they going to break the law? Hell no. Okay? So when we talk about being feared and, feared and respected, we are specifically talking about being able to objectively interpret and, more importantly, execute the law. Does that mean imprisonment? Sure. Does that mean fines? Sure. Does that mean public execution? If you need to get the point across in the beginning, you might want to do it all at once to kind of make a thing, but, you know, weekly crucifixions in Mosul probably are not going to work. And there's, what's the opposite of being feared? What's worse than anything else? Being hated. Being hated. How does one go about being hated? Reckless spending. First of all, if you run the, res if you run the country out of resources pretty quickly, sure. Especially if you use those resources to finance your own palaces and your own private security force. Okay, shout out to Saddam Hussein, as well as the members of the Kim family of North Korea. Okay. Excessive cruelty? Excessive, almost sadistic cruelty, especially if the law is, ex is executed subjectively. Certain people get off, other people get their heads cut off. Absolutely. But then, why, is, why isn't it okay to be loved? What's wrong with being loved? Everyone wants to be loved. Adam? Your power depends on... 
Ah, being loved means that you, in a way, it's more of an emotional thing, right? What else can we add to that? Love can change in short, short time period. You love someone for one month and next month you love somebody else. Very much so. Love can <laughs> yeah, Well, hey, you know. <laughs> What's probably the best and quickest way to change someone loving you to someone hating you? Marriage? Yeah, I heard that. I heard someone say, someone say marriage over there. Okay, so. I'm going to keep that one in the video. In this case, you say taxes. Well, you know, it, it ultimately goes down to the money. Let's just say that in order to get a quick boost of popularity, you're like, all right, for this year, nobody's paying taxes. Everyone's like, oh, that's kind of cool, yay. But then you realize the following year that the state has no money. So now you have to go not only go back to taxing people, but you actually have to raise taxes. So we go from nothing to both, like, what the fuck? You know? And again, as Joe Blow taxpayer, it's like, uh, I'm sorry, I don't see the logic in this, so screw you. Right? So being loved is risky because Oftentimes, people be people are loved when you're generous. Oh, you can give money left and right. That's awesome. You know. Let's put it this way: you'll have that one friend of yours. You love them to death, but you wouldn't give them twenty bucks because you know that you'll never see that money again. And that's why you love them. Because if you gave them money, you'd stop loving them because they'd never pay you back. Okay. So being loved is more of an emotional thing. Being hated is just being a horrible ruler. Being feared, that's the nice middle ground. And to add one extra you know, adjective to that, being feared and being respected. Being feared and being respected. Because what could be feared and being hated? Okay. Vito Corleone was loved, but he was also respected. Michael Corleone was feared as well as respected. Sonny was hated. Even though you can sympathize with him. And Fredo? Poor Fredo. Okay? Poor Fredo. Did you get the idea? Michael Corleone, good example of being feared and respected. In this case, this goes back to law and jurisprudence. Okay? People can be cruel but they need to be fair. See, if you're going to be the guy that lays down the heavy hand of the law, you better be prepared to do that for everybody, even if it's your own brother that commits a crime. If you're going to swing that meat axe, you better be objective to swing it for everybody. Justice, says Machiavelli, that's relative for each state. It doesn't matter. If one state is an enlightened democracy, cool. If another state is North Korea, okay. But justice needs to be universal. And if you do need to get rid of your enemies, if you just realize, you know, sometimes justice is good, but damn it, a good old purge is always healthy. You know, it gets, you know, it just gets rid of dead wood. Now, this ties up some loose ends. Then, for God's sake, do it in 48 hours and get it over with all at once. Get it all done in 48 hours if you need to. Again, Michael gets rid of all the heads of the five families while his God child is being baptized. I've been to Catholic baptisms. They don't last long. All right? Catholic churches get you in and out in 45 minutes. Done. He was able to bump off five people in 45 minutes in various parts of New York and New Jersey. Good for you. <laughs> That's how to do it, okay? But, if you're gonna lay down the heavy hand of the law, you sure as hell also better know the difference between what's legal and what's moral. And folks, they're not the same. What's legal may not necessarily be moral. And what you think is moral, Kim Davis, may not be what the Constitution says is legal. And at the end of the day, what trumps what? What is more important, legal, legality, or morality? Legality. legality. And why? Why does legality trump morality? 
How do you think? Yes? Legality is objective. Legality is not only objective, very good, but it is also what else? Constant? Sure. And why is it constant? Because it is codified. It's written down. Here's the Constitution. There it is. Do you agree with it? Doesn't matter whether you agree with it. That's the law. Do you agree that the speed limit on the highway should be 55? I sure as hell don't. But do you know that if you're going at a certain speed on the road, that if it's more than the speed limit, you run the risk of getting pulled over? Yes. Are you willing to take those consequences? If the answer is yes, have fun. If not, slow down. <coughs> yes? Um, in the book, it was noted that Monty Dillon said that um, they shouldn't follow Christian ethics. Um, would that be the legal versus the moral? Yep, very much so. Don't follow Christian ethics. That doesn't mean that he's anti-Christian. That doesn't mean that he's like, embrace atheism, yo. No, okay? <laughs> But what's wrong with a little Christian ethics? You know, what's wrong with a little love thy neighbor type of thing? I mean, something wrong with that, right? Yes, no, what? Then they, then they, have, then they, they will hear you. You can't exert your power. Ah, you see, that's the whole thing. You all of a sudden start practicing Christian morals, you run the risk of not being feared, but being loved. Loved is temporary, as we talked about before. Oh, there's one other thing. You might turn the other cheek. But what happens if, what's a, what's a distinct possibility if you turn the cheek? Someone's going to hit you on that cheek as well. You know, someone hits you on the right cheek, turn the left one. Oh, look at that, brand new spot, smack! You know, it's like, no, oh, okay, this is survival. Okay, this is survival. Christianity is sort of like if someone demands your shirt, give them your coat. You know what's going to happen if someone, if you give them your coat, they'll be like, oh, cool, I wasn't asking for that, give me your pants as well. Okay, no. Not good. So yes, you're absolutely right. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's one of the reasons why Christian morals can work great inside the country, outside the country. Forget it. And if you're going to be the leader, you have to kind of be a little bit more. Think more Caesar, less Christ. Okay. So democracy can be at home. That's a little fine and cool. Power politics need to be executed abroad. And what better person to exemplify? the notion of the ideal prince than Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck, one of the most important and probably one of the most powerful states in Europe of the mid to late 19th century. One of the individuals largely, if not exclusively responsible for uniting the German Empire in 1871. Otto von Bismarck exemplifies the type of Machiavellian leader that utilizes prudent warfare, limited warfare, but ruthless politics to get what he wants while minimizing the damage and avoiding large-scale conflicts. And I'd like to use Bismarck's 10-year path towards German unity from roughly 1860 to 1871 as an example. There are, some, there are very few people in history, Europe or otherwise, that's able to achieve what he does without causing Russia to invade the rest of Europe for a time period. Bismarck is also one of those people that you do not want to play Monopoly with. Okay? And why is that? For at least three reasons. Okay? This here is a map of what used to be Central Europe's junk drawer. We refer to that as the Holy Roman Empire. A whole bunch of states, city-states, petty-states, duchies, kingdoms, whatever it happens to be. Into this mix are two large German states, chief of which is Prussia, the one in the dark purple. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background so you're all on the same page here. So by 1860, there was this loose confederation of German states called, appropriately, the German Confederation. In that we have Prussia, Austria, Bavaria, Saxony, Württemberg, um, what else, Hanover, and other places. 
like before with Thucydides, there's two main powers. There's two powers that are constantly jockeying for control. Prussia in the north and the Austrian Empire in the south. The borders here seem a little strange. Okay? You've got red borders and you've got black borders. The black <coughs> borders constitute what was the German Confederation, which includes a part, not the entire piece, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and most of Prussia. All right, Bismarck is the chancellor of Prussia at this time. And he decides that the best way to achieve Prussian dominance is to eventually realize <coughs> the formation of a German state. <coughs> he is not a nationalist by any stretch of the imagination. Up to his dying days, Bismarck believed himself to be a Prussian patriot. So everything that he does is for his state, Prussia, not for some conceptual German kingdom. And the reason why I'm saying that will be revealed pretty soon. <clears throat> what he does realize is that by uniting all of the German kingdoms under a Prussian monarchy, he can effectively control most of Central Europe and be the head of an enlarged, powerful state pretty much the European version of Sparta at the time. Now, he's got a couple of things that are going against him, chief of which is he's got all these squabbling kingdoms and principalities within the confederation. And he also has limited manpower, but he's got a couple of other things at his side. One of which is his excellent diplomatic skills. And this is where a realist prince comes in handy. Because Bismarck pretty much cornered the market on how Germany can take over Europe in less than 10 years. It's been tried multiple times after that, and it failed. But there's a three-stage recipe for how this can happen. The first thing that, that Bismarck does, whenever he decides to send an army somewhere in Europe, is to contact Russia and tell them, guys, don't worry about it. Nothing's going to happen. Okay? Not aggression pact with Russia is the first, the first rule of Bismarck Club, is you create a non-aggression pact with Russia. Okay? That's a simple, easy thing. All right? You contact the Tsar. Hey, Tsar, what? I'm going to be moving my army. Oh, he's not good. Oh, I'm going moving it westward. Oh, he's OK. No problem. <laughs> you know? You want to take parts of Poland? No, no, no. We, Paul, we saw Poland a long time ago. Oh, da, da, leave it. OK. <laughs> as long as you tell Russia we're not fucking with the eastern side, we're good. OK, number two. Once you get Russia to be like, guys, we're all good, go back to sleep. Is that there's one other major power in oh. Europe that could ruin the day for Bismarck. They tend to be occupied elsewhere around the world, but you really don't want them on the opposing side. Great Britain. Great Britain. Now, Great Britain, now you've got to remember, this is the 1850s, 1860s. If Great Britain has one incontrovertible power, one military capability. What's Great Britain's big military thing going for it? It's got a navy. Why? Because Britain cares about one thing and one thing only. They had it for at least another century. The British Empire is kind of cool, but what's the money shot as far as the British Empire is concerned? What? America is independent. That's all fine and good as far as the empire is concerned. India. India. All roads lead to India. That's like the clearinghouse, yo. So what, you gotta think about this. Think about, there's Great Britain, here's India, way over here. There's two ways, actually there's three ways, that you can get to India. You can take the really long land route, but who the hell wants to do that? So what's the other really good way of getting to India? Hop on a boat. Hop on a boat. Okay, there's two ways that you can get to India from England. You can take the scenic route or you can cut through the gas station. What's the scenic route? All the way around Africa. That is one hell of a scenic route. Okay, which is the reason why Great Britain held on to South Africa as long as it did. Most of the British Empire, most of Britain's colonies, were for one reason and one reason alone, to secure safe routes and passages to India. 
Okay? Now, the other way that you can get to <coughs> India, the real quick shortcut, we, this is the ultimate cut through the gas station to bypass the red light, is what? The Suez, the Suez Canal. Okay, let's just forget all of Africa, go through the Mediterranean, hey, Egypt, how's it going? Down through the Gulf of Hormuz, and boom, you're there in no time. Which means that Great Britain also needs to control what other pieces of territory. Great Britain's got South Africa. Great Britain also needs what? Egypt. It needs the Nile. It needs Gibraltar. It basically, Bismarck's looking at the map and is like, okay, I need to unite all of this. Does this screw with Britain? It doesn't? Cool. <laughs> what is the surefire way of getting Britain to be like, oh, jolly good, do whatever you want? Sure, they're not going to target any bigger Sure, but what? But Of Britain's no. You don't need Britain. Britain can do their own thing. They're pretty cool. But ensure to Britain that you're not threatening their sea routes, which means, how are you going to threaten their sea routes? Don't build a navy. Don't build a navy. Simple. Bismarck is like, navy? What the hell do we need a navy for? Okay? We're a land power. So, rule number two, don't build a navy. Rule number one, not aggression pact with Russia. Rule number two, don't build a navy. If you've got number one and number two down, you're pretty much 85% of the way there to take over the rest of continental Europe. Because why? Because Great, because Great Britain doesn't care what you do on the continent, as long as you don't screw with India. And Russia doesn't care what you care on the continent, as long as you go and invade them. Pretty simple. Anything else? Rule number three. If you've got a target in mind, hey man, you're looking kind of pretty, okay? You end up ganging up on that one target by forming a set of intricate alliances with other powers to diplomatically <coughs> and militarily isolate the target. Once you've got the diplomatic allies behind you going to war with that target, the war should be quick, decisive, and on your terms. If you fight the war longer than a year, you're wasting resources. And once you have achieved your preset goals, end the war, dictate peace terms on your conditions, get what you want, declare victory, the war is over. This is not wars for adventure. This is not wars for glory. These are, defend these are offensively defensive wars for the future of a consolidated, Prussian-dominated German state. Okay? That clear so far? All right. So what does he do? The first place that he decides to pick on is Denmark. And Denmark, if you can see up there on the map, right, there's two city-states, there's two regions, Schleswig and Holstein. At least half the population were ethnic Germans that were living outside of the German Confederation. And mind you, Bismarck was not a German nationalist. He didn't care two winks about it. But he did know how to play the nationalist card. So he starts declaring, he starts passing information to the German Confederation, which was located in Frankfurt. Hey man, those Danes up there are, you know, beaten up on those poor Germans. They're forcing them to speak Danish. They're, you know, enforcing their own culture on them. The Germans are suffering. The Germans need to be in their own state. And all the others are like, yeah, you're right, that needs to happen. What are you going to do, Bismarck? I'll tell you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to fight in the name of the German people, and I'm going to fight in the name of German freedom. Right? He knows how to play the Patriot card. Okay. So that sounds like a really good idea. So what does he do? First thing he does is he contacts Russia. Hey guys, don't worry, go back to sleep. Oh, he's good. All right. <laughs> hey England, um, I'm going to go and do something up in the North Sea, but it's going to be, don't worry. You know what? Have fun in India. All right, jolly good. Any allies with France? Any allies with Austria? Poor Denmark is kind of cornered. Can't really fight. Because what alliances happen? These guys, the French and the Austrians don't even have to commit soldiers. You know, what the, you know what an alliance can simply do? I'm going to ally with you just so you sit back and don't defend Denmark. My, you know what you do with this alliance? Nothing. Just sit the war out. I don't have to do anything? Nope. Oh, okay, cool. Goes the war with Denmark. <coughs> it's quick, decisive, it's over, yay. Bismarck takes Schleswig and Holstein. And what is he end up doing? Well, what's even better is that he starts uniting all of the territory in the northern region and annexes them to Prussia. Oh, he's a very popular man at home. Okay, number two. 
Bismarck realizes that at some point, if he's going to unite the German state, he's going to have to knock out his major rival. It's going to happen at some point or another. What was the other major German power within the Confederation? The Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, this was a major dilemma for German nationalists. Do we include Austria or not? Those that said, yes, we have to include Austria, they're Germans, <clears throat> are quickly told by the Denat, well, hang on a second, guys. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is even a bigger junk drawer than ours because they've got a whole bunch of other people that aren't German. They've got Czechs, and they've got Poles, and they have Serbs and Croats and Romanians, and they have these really weird people called Hungarians. Well, do you want them in your empire? And some people are saying, well, you know what we could do? We could get the Austrian Empire to kind of break up, and they could just take, they're like, yeah, which empire has ever voluntarily you know, broken up in history? Exactly. So you know what? As much as we would like all Germans in one state, you know what, Austria, you've got enough problems to deal with. But, says Bismarck, I don't want you to screw things up for me, so nothing personal, but I'm going to have to go to war with you for one reason and one reason only, to knock you out of the German Confederation. So, <clears throat> what do we do? Step one? What's step one? Call Russia. Call Russia and tell them, don't go, guys, it's all cool. Step two, call Great, call Great Britain. Yeah, I don't think the British Navy really cares about the Austrian Empire. <coughs> All right, number three, who do we ally with? France and one other, and this, this, is, this was also kind of cool. There's one other country, we haven't talked about this country just yet, but it's the mid-1860s, a new kid on the block, and Bismarck allies with them as well. Italy. Italy. And why Italy? Because Bismarck kind of takes Italy aside and goes, yo, you know, we know that you people can't fight. It's all cool. We're Germans, you're Italians, it's all good, you know. Your wine is better than ours, whatever. But I could use a little backdoor help. I'm not asking you to send in the troops, but you know, maybe kick them below the belt a little bit. Just to distract them. Because, and I'll tell you what, if you defeat them, you want Venice. You want the Veneto region. I can give you that in the peace deal. And the Italians are just sort of like, ah, job, sure, okay. <laughs> you know, ride it on the little Vespas and, uh, you know, you know it, it, it's almost a melodic, um, uh, you know, uh, battle. Austria can't hold the candle to all of them. Austria is defeated. Now, aside from, aside from giving the Veneto region to Italy, Bismarck does not take any other territory. He does not even force Austria into crippling reparations. All that he does is force Austria to admit a military defeat so Bismarck has the tactical advantage at the peace terms to dictate his one goal. And that is simply, Austria, your punishment for losing this war that we kind of started is you're kicked out of the German Confederation. All right? You're out. Which means that he eliminates one of his most important rivals. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because you might think to yourself, you can stop right there, but he's all kind of cool. Yeah. Austria is kicked out, which leaves the southern German kingdoms all alone and vulnerable. Now, if you know anything about religion in Germany, it's usually 50-50 Protestant and Catholic. What's the predominant version of Christianity in southern Germany? Protestant or Catholic? Uh, Catholic. It's Catholic. Now, Austria is out of the picture, which means that these small countries need the alliances and need the support of one other major Catholic power in Europe. <coughs> what is the most natural country for them to look to for support? You know that Germany is going to go to war with these people at some point. France. France. Because it just wouldn't be a story about Germany unless France was invaded. <laughs> So France is now seen as the potentially new rival. So Bismarck's, all right, we're going to do this one more time. And now I'm going to go to war with France, simply to knock them out of the diplomatic game, and gives me the ability of incorporating so the southern German states. All right, so number one, you know the drill. Russia, hey guys, sit, hey, at this point, you're just like, hey Russia, it's me. Same old, same old, cool, not, you know? Hey, England, same old, same old. Again? Yeah, okay, cool. All right? Who else does he ally with? He allies with, you ready for this? 
Austria. Allies with Austria. You're going to think, so, wait a minute. You just punked Austria a couple of years ago. How, how the hell did this happen? Because Bismarck then tells the Austrians, hey, you know, look, sorry about that before. You know, business is business, you know. But, and this is probably one of the most fateful things that will hit Europe over the next 50 or so years. Hey, Austria, no hard feelings about kicking you out of the German Confederation. You know, we want to see you do well, but you can't really dictate what's going on over here anymore. But might I interest you in a few things that are happening on your southern border, the Balkans? I'm just saying. There's a small country that you could, you could take over if you wanted to. They're going to be a little thorn in your side if you don't handle them correctly. They're kind of eyeing Bosnia right about now. You might want to do something in the Balkans. What country was he talking about? Serbia. Serbia. By throwing Austria's direction down into the Balkans and kind of punking Serbia, yeah, that went over really well, didn't it? You know, block, block. Right? But he gets Austria to ally against France. The Franco-Prussian War was, again, the third quick and decisive victory. German army conquers and occupies Paris. And at the Treaty of Versailles, not the Treaty of Versailles, the Palace of Versailles, I'm sorry, in 1871, Bismarck is there to inaugurate the founding of the German Empire. Who becomes the first emperor of Germany? The previous king of Prussia, William I. Who becomes the first chancellor of Germany? The previous chancellor of Prussia, Bismarck, the only. To his dying day, he saw himself as a Prussian. And he realized that it was a Prussian-dominated state. Now, why did I go through all of this information? Because Bismarck's diplomacy, as well as his war tactics, for the most part, link up to what is an ideal realist diplomat. The ability and the desire to use war as a natural tool where politics can no longer function. But yet these wars are short, decisive, and overwhelmingly in his advantage. Bismarck does not take over territory that is not needed. There's a certain goal. When that primary objective is complete, the war is terminated. At the end of the day, Russia and Great Britain remain basically on the sidelines. And a new country forms in the center of Europe, which by 1900 becomes one of the most powerful, one of the most developed, and one of the most organized in all of Europe. To say that this was done in 20 years was nothing short of a miracle is still an understatement. Okay? But that is how realism can work if done correctly. This is actually a very nice <coughs> mixture of Machiavellian tactics as well as power politics. Right? Machiavelli says, no one to pull, no one to throw a punch. Don't be afraid to throw a punch, but also know when to pull a punch. Know what your allies are. And if you're going to go to war with Austria at one point and ally with them again, that means that you must have done some really good diplomacy. Right? Because Austria could have been completely justified in telling Bismarck to piss off. Right? And they didn't. So with that said, I think, I think, I think, we end at 410, correct? You know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to give you guys an extra 10 minutes. Out of, I'm going to give you, I'm going to just end class early because I think it's a little, um, not enough time to really talk about uh, security dilemma. So what we'll do is we will do security dilemma and we will do the John Mearsheimer reading on Monday. Please make sure that you have that. Also, also, remember, what are you also going to do next week after Monday? Recitation section. So we meet only on Monday of next week. After that, you will meet with your respective TA. So I'm hoping to finish up our discussion of